Last November, I found myself for the second time in a Manhattan doctor's office. I sat in an exam room, alone, with an operating gown on, a net over my hair, and some really cozy slippers on my feet. I was there early, at 7 a.m. A nurse came into this tiny exam room to ask me a series of questions before I went under anesthesia. She started with the basics. How tall are you? Uh, 5'5". Five, five. Did you empty your bladder? Yes. She took my blood pressure and told me what I'd be in for after I had this small surgery. A lot of people have the bloating, the pressure, the cramping, the lower abdomen, the thighs, the back, the buttocks, right? Mm-hmm. So the pain medication will kind of numb some of that cramping, but like pressure and bloating, eh, not so much, okay? Now, I do have people that come out and they're like, oh, I don't feel anything. Yeah, I did this once and I didn't feel anything. Okay, and then I have people that come out and they feel horrible, Mm -hmm. and it's different every time, Okay. okay? About 15 minutes later, I was brought into an operating room. A mask was fixed to my face. I breathed in deeply and faded under the anesthesia. When I woke up about a half hour later in the recovery room, I was in severe pain. It felt like my insides had gone through a blender, so I was given fentanyl through an IV. I was there on that chilly November morning, watching the liquid slowly drip through the tubes and into my arm, feeling hazy from the drugs. Because of a decision I made months prior, a decision I'd hope would silence this nagging question that kept popping into my head. What if I can't have kids? It's a question a lot of people, especially women, ask themselves as they enter their mid-30s, around the time her fertility begins to decline. And when the calendar turned over on my 32nd birthday, I was sharing a tiny apartment with roommates, drowning under the weight of student loans, and single. It felt like time was running out. So when I started with my team here back in 2019, I felt like I had hit the lottery. As part of my benefits, I found out that our company would pay for me to freeze my eggs. Out of pocket, it cost me more than $30,000. I couldn't afford that. I still can't, really. So, with this benefit, I felt like a huge weight had been lifted off of my shoulders. This treatment gave me the option to put my biological material on ice for a distant time in the future, when I'd have the baby equation figured out a bit more. And it's something I thought about while I was injecting myself with needles filled with hormones twice a day for two weeks. So I'm going to my stomach, wiping an alcohol pad, and taking the needle and shoving it in to my stomach. All right, success. I took the plunge, not for this podcast. That would be ridiculous, but for me. So yeah, It'll hopefully all be worth it. There are no guarantees even, but it's my best hope in the game of probability, I think. And it worked. I got a message that you had a question to confirm the amount, the uh, number of eggs that we froze. Um, So I just wanted to let you know that that number was 18. I did this process once in the winter and once in the fall of 2021. Now, I've got a total of 33 eggs chilling on ice. Yes, egg freezing is an intense and invasive process. But in a lot of ways, it has been a game changer. It's given me, and thousands of other women, the ability to have more autonomy over our reproductive lives. And this treatment isn't just helping folks like me, who are still trying to figure things out. It's the same process that egg donors undergo. So it's also given couples struggling with infertility, single parents, and queer couples the ability to have a family. 
But as game-changing as this process is, like other parts of the fertility industry, it's a bit of a black box. How much do we really know about the long-term impacts of egg retrieval? It just seems so unfair that she died so young. I'm just screaming at the top of my lungs, we have to do better for these young people. From Sony Music Entertainment and three Uncanny Four productions, this is Biohacked Family Secrets. I'm your host, TJ Raphael. On today's show, thousands of women, myself included, extract eggs for personal use or for cash. But is this life-altering treatment a lot more dangerous than we think? That's next. Stick around. My first memory is dancing with her in a very crowded bar and feeling very lucky that we found a new artistic soul. Back in the late 90s, Chad Gracia was starting an independent theater group in Brooklyn that, in his words did experimental, intellectually challenging, and long plays. And um, they weren't for everyone, although I think that they're works of pure genius to this day. Chad's theater group, called Inverse, wasn't playing to sold-out crowds. That was never the point. But the shows were creating a buzz in New York's indie theater scene. The productions which one reviewer described as Shakespeare on mushrooms, often included musical elements. Inverse needed a composer, and one night at a hip bar in downtown Manhattan, Chad and his troopmates met the perfect candidate. I just remember that she wasn't afraid at all of this sort of job interview with 10 mostly guys who thought we knew everything, but she... Just charmed us. The composer's name was Jessica Grace Wing. She had moved to New York a few years earlier to study filmmaking. But as Chad quickly learned, 20-something Jessica was a true multi-hyphenate. She was a writer, web designer, classically trained musician, and sound engineer. And she was a startling presence. She was tall, beautiful, charismatic, unique. She had really intense energy. She was a dancer. She loved music, and she started taking piano lessons when she was quite young. That's Jessica's mom, Dr. Jennifer Schneider. She lives in Tucson, Arizona, where Jessica grew up. Jennifer says her daughter showed an affinity for music at a very young age. When she was in the fourth grade, Jessica's teacher told her mom that she was a prodigy. By high school, Jessica was composing her own music. I was shocked when I heard it. It was a classical uh, string quartet, (laughs) and it was so good. (laughs) Jessica graduated from high school in 1988 and eventually landed at Stanford University. The Pixies, The Cure, and Nirvana were dominating the alt-rock scene. She soaked it all in. She was in a band where she played the banjo, singing these awful songs, you know, that have, I mean, they're not even musical, I would say. But anyway, and it's all about how awful parents are (laughs) and, you know, things like that. And even though she didn't like all of her daughter's music, Jennifer was happy that her kid was happy and seemed to be thriving in college. She just enjoyed everything she did. I mean, it was such a a pleasure to be her mother. By 1992, Jessica was in her last year at Stanford. She was about to graduate with a degree in modern thought and literature, which didn't exactly provide a clear career path for the college senior. And then, fate struck. So there were signs on the campus about donating your eggs. I can imagine Jessica standing on campus and seeing this flyer. She could make money for selling her genetic material? The idea probably would have seemed so 
novel to her. And that's because it was a new process. The first children born via egg donation had been conceived in the mid-80s, not all that long before Jessica saw this flyer. Egg banks back then, as they do now, targeted college-age women who might be willing to give up their genetic material for cash. The ads, both in the past and present, also contained other messaging. And the emphasis was that you're going to be doing a lot of people good, but the reason that the students were doing it was because it was a way to make money. Back in the 1990s, women were paid up to $3,000 for being an egg donor, which was a good chunk of change back then. But nowadays, some egg donors are paid as much as $50,000, or sometimes even more. And the first time when we were talking about it, I remember asking her, um, what, you know, why are you doing this? Because, and she said, well, I don't want to, uh, you know, I, I want to get the, I want to get the money. After talking to a friend who had donated her eggs, Jessica decided she wanted to move forward. So she reached out to the clinic. Since this was a really new procedure, it's unclear exactly what Jessica's screening process entailed. But an academic journal from around that time suggests the screening for egg donors was much more rigorous than it was for sperm donors. A clinic would suss out a potential donor's true motivations for participating and whether their spouse, family, or friends approved of their decision. Candidates were screened for anxiety, depression, paranoia, hostility, and psychosis and specifically asked to share traumas related to childbearing and whether they had abortions. Whatever the screening, Jessica was accepted into the program and decided to move forward. She was in her 20s, so understandably, her mom had some questions. And I said, well, is it safe? That, I mean, as a physician, that was, you know, my main concern. And she said, well... Yeah, they told me that there is absolutely no evidence that, uh, you know, that it does any harm. And I I didn't know anything about it at all about that field, so I went along with it. Dr. Schneider has a Ph.D. in molecular genetics and a medical degree. She was a practicing doctor of internal medicine for over 30 years. Even though this wasn't her area of expertise, she knew that egg retrieval was an intense, invasive procedure. For Jessica, though, the financial incentive was too good to pass up. She was a young creative who didn't want to depend on her mom for money. Donating her eggs, even if it was physically and emotionally taxing, would help her be more financially independent. And by the way, it is a grueling process. It's what I did when I froze my eggs. And I am just exhausted. I'm so tired. And I know it's because inside my body, my body is working really hard. The two-week process requires frequent ultrasounds and daily hormone injections to make sure mature eggs are developing. I woke up a couple times during the night because I was, like, laying on my stomach and I felt so bloated that, like, I had to wake up uh, because it just felt so uncomfortable. And, like me, after going through the hormonal treatment, Jessica went to the doctor and had her eggs removed. And it was a success. And then when she was told that there had been a pregnancy as a result of it, That put her in a category where she could earn like twice as much money or something. I don't remember the exact amount, but it was significantly more than before. And that uh, made her more interested in doing it for a second time. Jessica was now considered a proven donor. That meant she could be paid more for donating her eggs again. The clinic wanted her because she could produce the goods, a living baby. Jennifer says that Jessica's first donation went pretty smoothly. But when she decided to donate a second time a few months later... She found it was much harder. I felt worse after my second time, too. But other than the painful side effects during the retrieval process, 
Jessica donated three times in total. She made it through mostly unscathed. She went on with her life, and she moved to New York the summer after graduating college. She really liked the exciting life of New York, and um, she ended up meeting the love of her life there. They moved in together, and um, she was just, she was very happy. Jessica built a full life for herself in New York. She studied film, fell in love, played in bands, and became a co-founder and resident composer for the Inverse Theater. At Inverse, Jessica had finally found a playground for her sprawling musical talent. She could write in almost any style. I mean, we our plays were all very different in in their um, in their structure, in their in their themes. One of her first uh, big efforts was for a comedy called Midnight Brainwash Revival about the end of the world. She had a sort of Sergio Leone spaghetti western soundtrack mm. that went with the entire play and really brought it to life. After a few plays, Inverse decided that they wanted to tackle one of the few kinds of music Jessica didn't have experience with, an opera called Lost. Jessica was amped for the challenge. But very early on into the production, she received some troubling news. She had been having some stomach issues, and the doctor ordered a colonoscopy. And she called me that weekend and said that when she went for the colonoscopy, they couldn't do it because there was obstruction in her colon that prevented the instrument from going any further. I knew what that meant. And then shortly after that, she had further diagnostics and it showed that she had stage four colon cancer. And when I heard that, that's when I realized that being a doctor and knowing too much can be a very, very difficult thing. Jessica was just 29 years old. She was hitting her stride in the New York theater scene. She was engaged to be married. So despite the fact that the odds were stacked against her, she was going to fight. More after the break. When Jessica's friends at the theater found out about her diagnosis, they were stunned because she was so young and full of life. I remember having a meeting with her and with Kirk, our playwright, and she said, I will be fine. I don't, I'm a young, non-smoking, vegetarian, healthy 29-year-old. I'll be fine, and we'll finish this opera. For the next year and a half, Jessica worked on the opera while receiving treatment. Jennifer was across the country in Tucson, always wishing she could be doing more to help her daughter. She was going through radiation, chemo, surgery, you know, all that stuff. And I offered to move to New York to be with her. And she said, no, Mom, I just want to continue with my life. Jessica and her fiancé, Damien, shared an apartment in Brooklyn. And much to her mother's relief, he acted as her caregiver. He was the one who took her to all her appointments, who was there to support her, who did everything for her. While she was going through treatment, Jessica still found the time to work on the opera. She steadily pumped out beautiful music, but she also steadily declined. In the summer of 2003 almost two years since her diagnosis, Jessica knew she wasn't going to make it. Chad would come over to her apartment to go over her music for the show, but also just to talk about life and about death. She was pretty stoic about it. We had a few conversations where I asked her what was going through her mind. 
I know she was scared and I, and I know she didn't, uh, she didn't want to die. Even as the cancer took hold of her whole body, Jessica kept writing. Opening night was fast approaching and she was determined to finish. Chad knew that Jessica was hanging by a thread. So he held a gathering at his apartment so the cast and crew had a chance to say goodbye. And I remember she walked in with an oxygen tank and she looked very, very skeletal. And she came in and sat down. It was hard for her to talk or to breathe, but it was very clear that um, she wanted to be there. Everyone took a moment to kind of sit next to her, whisper in her ear, uh, hug her. I spent most of the nights just sitting at her feet with one of my arms around her leg. About a week later, Jessica couldn't leave her bed. But still, she continued to write. She turned in her final sheet music, and we had to do a rehearsal because the opening was a few days away. And it was her mother's idea that we do the actual rehearsal, the sing-through, in Jessica's bedroom. And we all went over there. Jessica was conscious, and she had a hard time speaking, but her eyes were telling the story of how grateful she was. She listened to the entire opera with a sort of a just big smile on her face and tears in her eyes. Less than a week before her birthday and hours after she turned in her final pages for Lost, Jessica Grace Wang died. It was July 19th, 2003. She was 31. Jennifer was at her daughter's side until the very end. You know, there's good and bad about being there with someone who dies because, of course, I have um, a very clear memory of exactly what it was like when I was in that room watching her die. But I'm glad I was there, you know. But the memory is terrible. In August, a few weeks after her death, Lost opened at the New York International Fringe Festival. What you're hearing is music from Jessica's opera. Opening night was incredibly emotional. The cast performed to a sold-out audience that overflowed into the aisles of the theater. I just remember that the theater was shaking because the theater that we were in, the chairs were attached to each other. And so many people in each row were sobbing back and forth, like almost like rocking like a child sobbing, that it created this kind of wave of just tears. Everything seemed to be infused with Jessica. And it was very, you know, the music was gorgeous, but the emotions were just too much for us. Everyone in Jessica's life was devastated by her death. Her fiancé, her family, her friends and colleagues. And as a physician, Jennifer couldn't help thinking that Jessica's cancer just showed up out of nowhere. How had her healthy, young, thriving daughter died of this aggressive disease? That was the question that Jennifer couldn't shake. After her death, for various reasons, uh, Sloan Kettering had some tissue from her surgery, and they were asked to do a, a DNA testing to see if she did have some genes that would predispose her to colon cancer, and there were absolutely none. No genetic predisposition. So how did this happen? 
Coming up, Jennifer searches for answers. Stay with us. Before her daughter decided to sell her genetic material, Jennifer knew very little about the medical risks associated with egg donation. Jessica had been told there were no known risks, but... There's a big difference between there are no known risks versus there are no risks. When Jessica signed up, egg donation had only been around for less than a decade. So... In reality, it was impossible to know if there were any long-term risks. Jennifer wanted to look at the medical research on egg donation after her daughter's death. By this point, it had been almost 20 years since the first egg donor baby had been born. Surely there must be extensive research. It doesn't exist. And that is still true in 2021. It's, I, I mean, it just boggles the mind. When I first started working on this story, I thought, that can't be true. But it is. There has never been a long-term study on the effects of egg donation. Unlike people who have gone through other medical donations, like with kidneys, there is no national donor registry in the U.S. to track how patients have fared 5, 10, or 20 years down the line. I mean, if you do a kidney donation, those kidney donors are followed up. But egg donors are not considered patients who have gone through procedures that may have consequences. Jennifer feels that part of the problem is that sperm donation, which has a much longer track record, is extremely safe. So people think the same thing about egg donation. But Jennifer says that's a flawed theory. And as you know, there's only one risk of a sperm donation. And that consists of your hand being tired. <laughs> um, there's, never, there's never any discussion of the safety of, of the procedure for men who donate sperm. And I think that egg donation is viewed by too many people and lawmakers and all that as similar to sperm donation so that thinking about long-term consequences just never gets on anyone's radar. But Jennifer has been able to grab the ear of at least one academic researcher. And so it was initially back in about 2013 that I, I was introduced, or I met Dr. Schneider, and we've sort of been in contact ever since. Professor Diane Tober began studying egg donors almost a decade ago at the University of California, San Francisco. She's been trying to glean more data on the potential long-term effects of egg donation. To date, Tober has interviewed almost 300 donors and surveyed almost 600. And that is really the first project like this to, to be done anywhere, let alone in the United States. Doctors, mine included, say the egg retrieval process is safe. And that advice is usually based on analyses of IVF patients. But Professor Tober says that approach is deeply flawed because there are some important differences between IVF patients and egg donors and freezers. People who are undergoing infertility treatment are often older, don't necessarily have the lower BMI that egg donors would most likely have, they're less fertile, and so I don't see that there's necessarily a correlation between what fertility patients experience and what egg donors might experience. Right, right. I mean, a, a person who might be undergoing IVF, as you said, is likely to be older. And less responsive to the medications. Because they're experiencing infertility, many of them already have low ovarian reserve in their mid-30s or so, and they're not going to respond as aggressively to the stimulation medications as, say, a 22-year-old who's chosen because of her fertility. And this is why Jennifer believes her daughter's colon cancer could have been caused by the repeated hormone injections she took when she donated her eggs. Jessica was in her early 20s. She wasn't experiencing infertility. And then she loaded her body with hormones. Female hormones are known to increase the risk 
of various cancers. It's not unreasonable that they could also increase the risk of something like colon cancer. It's an interesting thesis, and frankly, it scares the hell out of me as someone who went through two intense rounds of hormones. But when it comes to Jessica, her mother's theory can't be proven. In reality, I can't say for sure that Jessica's cancer was solely caused by her decision to donate her eggs. No one can. But I was curious to see what Professor Tober thought about the potential links between cancer and egg donation. I do have donors in my study that have had various cancers post-donation, you know, within a year to five years post-donation. Is there a direct causal connection? We don't know, because maybe they would have had that cancer anyway, or maybe it's something related to the surge of estrogen in the body due to the fertility hormones. So those things are really hard to identify. Just like in Jessica's case, determining causation is extremely difficult, if not impossible. Professor Tober says it would take a very well-funded, longitudinal study over at least 10 years to compare those who have donated their eggs and those who haven't. That would be a very costly and time-heavy study to do, but that would be pretty much the only way you could definitively say, yes, there are these long-term implications with egg donation or any controlled person undergoing controlled ovarian stimulation. And this kind of study is something that Jennifer is pushing for. Since her daughter's death, she's become an advocate for more research on the long-term effects of egg retrieval. When you lose a child, just out of the blue like that, you try to make something positive come out of it. Jennifer has written a case report detailing Jessica's egg donation and subsequent cancer diagnosis in the journal Fertility and Sterility. For those of you who don't know, That's the official publication from the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, or ASRM for short. It's the leading group in the fertility space. Jennifer even testified before Congress in favor of a national egg donor registry so the industry can track how donors fare in the long term. But she's fighting an uphill battle. There's been a tremendous amount of resistance from these organizations about keeping a registry, actually following up egg donors to find out what happened to them 10 years later. But if your daughter had died as a result of egg donation, and the possibility is it could have been related to it, maybe you'd feel a little differently about it. You know, the industry argues that it can regulate itself, that it doesn't need sort of new rules or standards, regulations, Um, you know, spoken with the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, and that's sort of their official stance. Um, Why do you feel like self-regulation is not enough? I think that when you work in an industry where your profits depend on certain decisions, you're going to be very biased toward avoiding actions that are likely to affect your profits. Since Jessica first donated her eggs back in the early 90s, the market for egg donors has exploded. It's a huge business. Even venture capital firms have taken notice. But Jennifer and Professor Tober want people considering egg donation to be informed about the benefits and the potential risks. And they're not alone. You're giving something to someone that you can't get back. And it isn't like a kidney donation where your other kidney is going to last you the rest of your life. You're also going to run out of eggs like everybody else. Dr. Amy Ivazade is a fertility specialist in California's Bay Area. Yeah, so I'm basically a baby maker. Dr. Amy, as she likes to be called, works at the ground level. She provides services like IVF for patients who are struggling to get pregnant on their own. And she also works with a lot of egg donors and freezers in her practice. Some donors, it seems, don't know that the procedure could wind up creating challenges down the line. Just open TikTok to hear the proof. Questions I get asked as an egg donor all the time. 
Most common is does it affect your fertility? The answer is no. But Dr. Amy says that's not the case. As we get older, we run out of healthy eggs. And once we run out of healthy eggs, our desire to have a baby doesn't run out. And so we have to look to creative family building. Women are born with a finite number of eggs from birth. If they wind up donating them multiple times in their early 20s and then have trouble conceiving themselves at 37 or 38, well, it's not something they can just get back. It's why Dr. Amy started the Freeze and Share program at her clinic. And I feel like every egg donor should have their eggs frozen for themselves in their first donation. I wish I could, like, say we have to pass a law, but I know that that's not going to happen. Whether it's an egg donor or someone starting IVF, Dr. Amy really cares about her patients. It's why she does extensive genetic screening on them to make sure they're not at risk for various forms of cancer. But Dr. Amy acknowledges that testing egg donors for genetic risks is not the standard across the industry. It should be. I'm just one person. I can just do what I do in my practice, and I'm just screaming at the top of my lungs, we have to do better for these young people. We have to look out for them. It is so unfair because egg donation, you can see how passionate I, I am about this. We are getting older as a society, and we're going to look to young women more and more to donate their eggs. And so it is so important for us to to really be able to look out for them. I wanted to know, in her experience, how common is it for an egg donor or IVF patient to later get a cancer diagnosis? You know, I take care of that probably 10,000 women now, and so many egg donors. I haven't had a single egg donor that's come back and said, I have cancer now. And I'm really close with my patients, including my egg donors. I imagine that should that have come up, someone would have reached out to me. But Dr. Amy also does make sure she does genetic screenings of her donors. That's not the industry standard. And if she does find something worrisome, she turns a potential egg donor away. I had a recent situation, um, maybe about six months ago, where something came up like that. The egg donor, we found that she actually had two high-risk mutations for cancer. And I said to her, I'm so glad that I met you because considering egg donation could have saved your life. And we're not doing egg donation anymore. The unsatisfying truth here is that we may never know definitively what caused Jessica's cancer. Not until there's more robust research on the long-term effects of egg retrieval on donors. And it's something Jennifer is going to continue to advocate for. And just like the woman who founded Mothers Against Drunk Drivers was trying to prevent other people from dying because of drunk drivers, I have had a goal over the last 20 years to prevent young women from experiencing what Jessica experienced. And her calls for change are not going unheard. We wanted to really organize. If you're crazy enough to think you can change the world, then maybe you can. What the government is doing is they are creating a second-class citizenry. Next week on Biohacked, Family Secrets. Donor-conceived activists get aggressive in their calls to change the system. Biohacked Family Secrets is produced by 3 Uncanny 4 and Sony Music Entertainment. I'm your host, TJ Raphael. Our program is edited by Maureen McMurray. Our producers are Nick Mott, Jennifer Siegel, Shane McKeon, Krista Ripple, and Rahima Nasa. Jenny Kim is our production manager, and Alicia Baitoup composed the theme. Our fact checkers are Will Tavlin and Ava Ahmed Behi. This episode was mixed by Joanna Catcher at Nice Manners. Special thanks to Laura Mayer, Nuna Sharafadeen, Amy Eason, Jennifer Womack, and Allison Sherry. 
have a question or comment about this week's show, send me a tweet at TJ Raphael or email us at biohacked at 3 4com For 3 Uncanny 4 and Sony Music Entertainment, I'm TJ Raphael.